That's a big yeah. problem if you're trying to get something convincing in camera. It looks like a great on-set monitor. Uh, I mean, DigiOps will love it. That's not what's in my head, and the barrier was more deciphering the interface. And I'm seeing it as if I'm looking through a real camera, which is, that's the bit that got me excited. Whoa, uh, what screen was that? I don't know if you're like me, I used to have final, 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 <laughs> final. Yeah. Yeah. We know we're always working on the actual file that should be used. Yeah. Hey, welcome to a breakout session for Beyond the Frames. Uh, I'm here at IBC, this is day two, and I'm joined by uh, Brett Danton, how are you doing? I'm good, enjoying IBC. Yeah, what yeah. stood out to you uh, in the first day yesterday? Uh, so for me, the thing that, because I do a lot of virtual production, yeah. uh, the thing I'm really enjoying looking at is the new screens. Uh, you know, I think it's always been sort of, the screens with virtual production has always been a little bit of a fight. Yeah. What I'm enjoying seeing is this stuff now with really good black levels. I think HDR is now finally sort of bit across. They've got large color spaces. Yeah. Uh, I think the screens are really something that's really pushed on for me. So uh, contrast levels and black levels. Yeah. Does frame rate come into it? Because if you're shooting, do you shoot 24, depending on the project? Uh, well, 25, because 25. we're in the right country. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 25 and 50 is you know starting to become progressive. used now. Progressive, do you 50 progressive? Yeah, everything yeah. on progressive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, I've just seen a screen rate, that, a large display that has a refresh rate of 7,000, which is pretty phenomenal. Whoa, um, what screen was that? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very secretive one. I had to go into a little code room and sign a NDA not okay. to talk about it. But I mean, this, the refresh rate on it was great. But I think the problem we've always suffered with is that the sort of reflective coatings on the front of the screens, always giving it a little bit of a gray. So trying to get a full black out of an image has been quite hard when you're shooting in a virtual production. You know, you put your lights in there and then they all reflect back on the screen. So And that's a big yeah. problem if you're trying to get something convincing in camera. Yeah, exactly. Because you've you've exposed your shot right, hopefully yeah. got some depth of field, so yeah. any not moire, but yeah. anything that would give it away that it's a screen yeah. is kind of masked by your depth of field. But if you've got a massive glare on it, it won't kind of match the no, lighting you've got well, set up. Well, then the problem is you try and grade it back because you want to try and get a full black back into the background image. If you know, if it's a black scene, and then you end up crunching down the foreground. So yeah. you know, it deep, it's defeats like, you, the purpose. Yeah, do you light the foreground so it's a washed out grey? Then do you hope your colour grader can do it? So yeah. you're sort of stuck with all those different ways of doing it. So that's something I've been really interested to look at. Looks like they've really improved on quite a few of them now. Be able to swap stuff in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, I and mean, we're obviously on the Pro Art stand. They've got monitor, which I've been wanting them to come out with for a while, which is this SDIN. Uh, looks like a great on-set monitor. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, DigiOps will love it, I think. You yeah. know? And I think SDI is really important for me on monitors because it's, you know, display port, HDMI is great when you're in a controlled environment, but SDI is the standard on-set. So, mm -hmm. you know, to now have a small monitor that we can work with SDI is brilliant. Uh, the form Canon, factor is yeah. super helpful, right? Well, it's just so quick, it doesn't break. I mean, yeah. the problem with HDMI is, you know, you get it out there on set, cables are only a certain length, yes. people stand on it, they break the connectors, yeah. pulls out, you know, SDI, it's clipped in, it's done. Yeah. You know, everybody's got the cables in their bag, yeah. so, you know, that works out really well. Um, Canon have got their new Flexing, which I really like the look of, and that's full frame zoom, which I think for virtual production is really good. Um, yeah, it looks like there's some really nice toys. I mean, I, as I say, I'm here looking at the virtual world. Yeah. Uh, and then computers are pushing up speed and limit, you know, what they can do more now. Yeah, one, of the, one of the reasons I was excited about catching up with you here is because I know you kind of bridge the gap between your uh, knowledge of the analog production yep. world, the filmmaking stuff that we love, and if I think back to my time on, on live action sets pre-virtual production yep. capabilities, um, I love the spontaneity we can do on set, right? With, yeah. You've got the actors, you've got your, you're blocking your shots in a physical space. Mm -hmm. I'm finding with virtual production tunes as, as they get more sophisticated, like I use Omniverse a lot for yep. my animated show, um, I'm starting to get a little bit of that spontaneity into my CG workflow, which yep. I can't say was the case maybe two or three years ago because the real time stuff hadn't really got to the point where it was intuitive for someone like me who's not really technical. Yeah. I'm not, not a I'm not a TD or a, or a CG technician. I'm more of a well, story is my thing yeah. really, and an artist. So, how have you found that the, you know, the the tools, the software tools, and the environments? How have you found that kind of bridging your gap? Probably very similar to you in some ways. Yeah. I mean, I've only been using. Uh, 3D tools for three years, uh, right. and Omniverse really was probably the one that I kicked off with. Uh, before that, I had tried other tools, 
I'd opened them up. I mean, my background is uh, still photographer originally, uh, director of photography and then directing. And I jumped into it and they were so complex. And I started to try and, you know, do some video online courses with them. And I, I just gave up. Yeah, similar, um, similar story with yeah. me. I would only get so far. And exactly. like, that's not what's in my head. And the barrier yeah. was more deciphering the interface, yeah. figuring out the workflow, because it felt so removed from the natural, what well, it also, became intuitive the intuitive way of working. The look, the way it looks, on, you know, so. The feedback loop wasn't there, yeah, right? Yeah, so I mean, with Omniverse, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll explain a little bit of some of the stuff we've been doing with yeah. it, but I mean, when I put a camera in there, I can program point A, point B, do the track, and I'm seeing it as if I'm looking through a real camera, which is, that's the bit that got me excited. My focus is working, my aperture's working, all of that sort of stuff the way I would normally. But the big thing is, it's doing it in a real-time world. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, when we path trace and render it out for the final, it's not going in real time. But the thing is with it, is I'm looking at it as if I'm using a real camera. And that's, that's what really got my fancy with it. Um, and it's an incredibly complex piece of software if you want to go that far with it. Right. I'm not diving into it, mm -hmm. but also as well, because it's got the collaboration stuff, mm -hmm. the stuff I can't do, and believe you me, there's probably 99% of it, <laughs> I can get other people to do for me. Yeah. And then it's it's all live on the on the nuclear server. So I can just see I can actually see them do the changes for me. In real um, time. In real time. And that that's quite an amazing thing. And also as well, you know, some of the other software that other people they've got connectors, so you can link those all into it. So, you know, what, what we've been doing with it, uh, we've been specialising in doing a lot of uh, digital twins of sets or locations. Um, and that came around because, you know, we went to Namibia and did a shoot there. Now, normally, you know, you'd have a crew of, say, 75 people. Well, in Namibia, they've changed it now because they had all sorts of environmental dramas with shoots. Mm -hmm. So they've dropped that down to having 12 people. And obviously, you know, companies also want to change their environmental foot footprint. They don't want to send loads of people. Um, so what we started looking at was LiDAR scanning insects and using photogrammetry and we, we went to Namibia and we scanned in massive pieces of road uh, and then we shot a load of HDR, di uh, HDR domes. We take those into Omniverse. We actually have a digital twin of the real world location. And then using physics, using the tools that Omniverse has. The lighting. The lighting. Uh, we can actually drive a car up the road and it looks real. Right, uh, right down to dust coming off the back of it. Once that car track is programmed in and we've got it, I can forward and go backwards and forwards on it, I can then program my camera moves up like I would in the real world. And it's so all true to scale because it's, all, it's a scan yep. of the actual location. It, 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 everything matches. So the other thing we do is we shoot a lot of background plates. Uh, and now there's, you know, there's some uh, positioning systems where I can even take the position of the drone, feed that into Omniverse, and then my real world background plate lines up perfectly with my CGI plate. So I'm basically compositing inside of one piece of software in real time. That's so the, and yeah. because it's reflecting, it's using the the, the, the 3D mesh, mm -hmm. all the reflections on the vehicle are correct. Uh, and you know, it's not just cars we're using it for, we're using it for a lot of other things. Um, we've just started experimenting with food. And you know, that's probably gonna take us a little bit longer because the sheen and stuff on the food, and again, we're and using- the intricacies, right? It's yeah. not talking about man-made surfaces or you know, exactly. manufactured, I should say. Exactly. You're not talking about manufactured surfaces, yeah. like you know, hard surfaces like yeah. buildings or walls or vehicles. You're talking yeah. about organic stuff. Organic materials. So, you know, again, and that's where it's worked out really well, is I work, we worked out how to do the, do the photogrammetry of getting the food in but then we can send it out to somebody else to do all the materials and get the shines all correct and getting mm -hmm. that all. And I can see that all getting updated in Omniverse as, as I'm going. Yeah. So, but th the thing for me that really got me was, was the lighting in it. Uh, I mean, as a cinematographer, as right? As a cinematographer, it it's a path yeah. trace renderer. The light feels real. And I mean, obviously you doing your animations, I found the lighting so fast and to see it happening yeah. in front of you. Yeah. Uh, and that was for me sort of became a bit of a game changer. I mean, when I drop in a sun or a dome, it, it looks real. Right. And yeah. I feel like the way I set up my lights, even though I'm creating an animated show, yeah. it, it all my live action skills of directing on set, set, you know, the way lights behave in a yeah. space, color and light, I understand it yeah. for my animation. And so it's a, it's a great way to transfer my skills, yeah. not, not to sort of keep them separate. Um, you know, it's not like animation's one box and live action filming's another. I can kind of use all my skills. Because yeah. of that real-time feedback oh, loop, I'm in, the, yeah. in, in, in mean, that paradigm. When I 
was DPing him, if we did a large shoot outside, I'm a bit of a firm lover of one large light. I think if you've got loads of lights everywhere, you're getting very confused. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I see it. I mean, I, look, when I first started lighting, you know, I had a whole bag of lights, I could pull them all out. And, and then suddenly you can't work out what light's doing what. Right. And I found it really interesting inside of Omniverse, I could pop in one light, mm -hmm. and that worked like the sunlight. And I could actually use things like bounce boards. I could use cutters. I could yeah, exactly, use reflections. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. so so I go Cause well because it's yeah. so based on physics, real physical light. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And uh, on the vehicles, you know, we've had uh, dust coming up behind them because obviously the Namibia scene was a dusty road. Uh -huh. Well, we programmed in the physics into the dust, and the dust looks like real dust coming off the back of car tires. Yeah. The, the physics on the vehicle as the vehicle is driving up the road is the vehicle is acting the way you would expect it to work. So. Having all of those things to it is quite phenomenal. Yeah, and there are parallels to my workflows, like the, how accessible the physics stuff is, yeah. is really helpful for you know, automating some of the animated yep. effects that I want. Yep. I want to go back to something you said about collaboration and seeing people in your crew update the scene yep. live. That's because of the, um, the, the sort of the foundational format that yep. that, that a nucleus sort of uses the, the exactly. USD of it all. Yeah, exactly. So, Working on the USD. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, example, we were doing some stuff uh, with cosmetics bottles last week. Uh, you know, we wanted to get the shine perfect on the cosmetics bottles, and we had somebody else who's built those sort of 3D models. It was something I needed changed, and all I had to do was I'd give him a call. I was sitting at home. He was sitting at home, in front of my machine. He went in, did the little changes on the same file I was using, and a little, a little blue box flashed up and said, fetch updated USD. Bang, it was in my machine and I had mm -hmm. the update. Mm -hmm. you know, and, that, and we're on the other sides of the country. Yeah. So you know, straight away that was solved. I didn't even have to think about it. So you know, it's not, and also so that's not giving us confusion with files, mm -hmm. because I don't know if you're like me, I used to have final, 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 <laughs> yeah. final. Yeah. Uh, and I think anybody probably who's creative always has that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we, know, we know we're always working on the actual file that should be used. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, and then when you look but at... But USC's got that versioning built into yeah, it, Yeah, right? exactly. I can always go back as yeah. well. Uh, we're really excited. There's some other tools that they've got coming out, which we're about to start playing with. They've got mm. things like variant managers, mm. which I think with the car stuff is going to be really important. You know, mm. if, if a car in... The certain country prefers blue and in this country prefers white, we can just hit the button and it will do that. Um, and then we've been moving on and using Gen AI inside of it. Uh, so, you know, we take our scene and we, and we you know, start searching for trees and we're trying to drop in 3D trees and let those scatter around. So yeah. we can change that mesh and change the look of that whole scene really quickly. That's really quickly. interesting because I use the, the same suite of tools. Yeah. It, it really helps my pre -vis process. Oh, yeah. But you're, are you going to Final Pixel with some We're of this We're going stuff? to Final Pixel with everything. In camera as well, huh? Yeah, yeah, everything's going to Final Pixel. So our render times are, you know, we actually saying that, they're really not that bad. I mean, I can render out something that might be a finished full HDR 4K, 25 frames, two minute piece will render out in about six hours, yeah. depending on how complex the scene is. Mm -hmm. But I think that's phenomenal. That's completely, path traced and I mean normally you know so so sometimes we've done stuff for car companies where where a car commercial might have taken us a month to a month and a half to finish because we've already got the assets built we can drop them in render it we've, we've got stuff finished in a week wow which is quite you know that's a that's yeah a, it's a massive an amazing change. performance and then game. on top of that then we can start to drop in the variations left hand right hand drive blue yeah. color this color yeah, yeah. different variations for different the country around yeah even a different lighting setup just change the lighting we yeah. can just change the hdri dome in the background yeah um the the amazing thing is the way that hdri dome works is all the reflections on the vehicle are completely correct it figures out um has a thing called Rayleigh Atmosphere, which is a little box I tick a lot. Mm -hmm. And that, that gives the light, the wrap feel that you would get in the real world. Mm -hmm. And you can literally see it. You press the button, you see this light wrap around the vehicle, the reflections all come correct. And are you running all of this with a workstation, like a ProArt workstation, or are you using the cloud? How are you? No, so I, I keep it all local. We store everything in the cloud. Uh, I, our scenes are quite big, so we, we do jump around. I have a couple of machines there which are working on the, the pro art. 
uh, and then we have a big rendering node uh -huh. uh, which has eight A6000s in it. So that's that'll a bit, do it. That's a bit of a beast. <laughs> uh, and you don't want to be in the office when that starts kicking out a bit I of heat. Bet. It's quite funny, but it's uh, but that that thing is um, purely for rendering, and it's an absolute beast. Yeah, um, fantastic. We have started playing around with some of the headless cl uh, node rendering. Yeah, uh, and we're looking into that, or we can send it up to the cloud to use as well. Um, because a lot of our stuff is experimental, uh, I like to be able to see it as it's rendering. Um, and we kick everything out as EXR sequences as well. Mm -hmm. So you know mm -hmm. everything's coming out in 32 bits. So. Well, the high quality real time yeah. renders mean that you're less likely to encounter a nasty surprise in your final render. Exactly, yeah. and we can see it as it's going along. Yeah, Absolutely. And I, and I can work on that file as we're going, so yeah. you know, it, it, it makes for a great workflow. So Brett, thanks so much for your time here at IBC. It's, it's been, been a great pleasure. catching up with you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And thank you for tuning in to this breakout session for Beyond the Frames. Uh, look out for some more from uh, our IBC coverage.